Hello, I'm Pastor Kent King Nobles. This is the worship service for the faith community of the Normal First United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here for worship. During the service today, I want to talk to them about this holiday called Juneteenth. And I want to ask why it is that sometimes good news arrives so late and what we can do about that. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Also, we're going to have an interview during the service with one of our community leaders, Mr. DeWitt Bingham. He's going to share some of his insights on what's been going on in our nation and on uh, racial justice. So I'm looking forward to that interview also. And uh, Miss Jill, during the children's message, is going to introduce a new life app that we can learn from. It is good that we can be together even in this way. So let us worship our God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, anointing us to bring good news, to proclaim favor, to provide the day of the Lord is coming. Okay kids, I'm ready to learn more about faith. How about you?
everyone, it's Miss Jill. It's another great day here at the McNiff House slash studio, and I am so excited that you are uh, here as we continue to focus on our life app on faith. Now, faith is trusting in what you can't see because of what you can see. It's kind of like the wind. Right? Think about a windy day. We can feel the wind on our face. And sometimes we can see some things that the wind does. We can definitely hear it. But we can't see what's making all of that happen. But we know it's there. It's just like faith. We can't see God, but if we take a closer look, we can see all the things that God has created and all the things that God has done in people's lives all throughout history and all throughout our lives. So today we're going to talk about a very important person who actually wrote most of the New Testament. And you might know him as Paul. But he also went by another name, Saul. And we're going to focus on Saul today. As a young man, Saul was sent off to study. And in my mind, I see like a young college age kid heading off to college, right? He's in a study. And faith was really important to Saul. And that was right at the time where many people were beginning to follow Jesus. And he heard so much about Jesus and it was a really confusing thing for Saul, right? So Saul finished his studies and he actually became a religious leader. And the religious leaders, including Saul, were not having it. They weren't sure about Jesus because Jesus changed everything. I mean, Jesus changed the way people saw God. And the religious leaders were having a hard time with that. So they actually tried to put a stop to it. They did, Saul included. And Saul is not what we would call a good guy. I would even probably dare to say he was a bit of a bully. Not a bit of a bully, but a big bully. So he made it his mission to really just harass and bully and just try to get the people who followed Jesus to not do that anymore. And he found out that there were a bunch of people that were following Jesus in Damascus. So he and a bunch of guys made this plan. They were going to go up to Damascus and they were going to harass the people that were following Jesus there and try to get some of them arrested and just make their lives really bad. So it took a few days to get there. And right when they were about to enter into the city of Damascus, a bright light shone from heaven and it actually knocked Saul to the ground like that and and there was a voice and it, it said Saul Saul why are you opposing me and Saul was like who are you and the voice like replied I am Jesus I am the one you are opposing. Now get up and go into the city and there you will be told what to do. Um, Saul was probably like, what just happened? And the men, they just stood there like this. They were unable to speak. It was just like, and guess what guys? Saul, when he, could, when he stood up, he couldn't see. Put your hands over your eyes. It was like that. He was blind. He couldn't see. He, he was terrified. His friends helped him get to Damascus where they stayed at, I don't even know. They stayed at maybe a friend's house. They stayed at some guy's house. I'm not sure about that. And for three days, Saul could not see. Totally blind. And he couldn't eat or drink. And he was doubting everything that he had thought before because he knew 
He had just had an encounter with Jesus and he couldn't deny it anymore. And so after the three days, Saul, 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 Saul got in a whole new way because guys, this is the bottom line. Je knowing Jesus changes everything. And Saul had an encounter that day and it changed everything. Everything that Saul thought that he knew was changed forever and his life was never the same again. Now, God might not show up in our lives like a big flash of light like he did for Saul, but there are lots of times when God shows up in our lives in other ways, only to show us something new like he did for Saul. Maybe it's out in nature, right? So many times when I'm outside and I'm just in awe of God's creation, or maybe it's a song that you hear. There's so many beautiful songs that just can really pull us closer and God can talk to us through music. Other people, God will put people in your life that will show you something new about God. So sometimes God can use something that's really hard and something that's really bad and use it for something good. He can help us see things in a whole new way because knowing Jesus changes everything. So let's put our focus on ways we can keep our eyes on God and look to see how we can discover new things about God. Let's pray. God, it is just so amazing how you changed Saul's life. After you met him there on that road, he was never the same. You do the same for us too. When we put our faith in you, you transform us on the inside. You make us want to love others instead of just living for ourselves. You change the way we see everything. Please help us to see your way as we live every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take a closer look. Focus. Love ya. Hello everyone, I am here with Mr. DeWitt Bingham. Um, DeWitt, thank you so much for coming over, joining us. Um, I've enjoyed getting to meet you already and look forward to, to being a friend of yours, um, but I really appreciate your time coming over to help us and share some insights. Um, just a little bit about you. So you're assistant pastor at your church? That's correct. I go to Integrity Deliverance Ministry. Uh, where the pastor is Joseph and Vicki Brown. Okay. And I've been a member there since 1987. I accepted Christ uh, on campus of ISU, actually, and I've been a Christian for about 35 years and I've been preaching for about 25 years. Great. And in addition to that, you're a professor? That's correct. I actually uh, have a bachelor's and master's degree in criminal justice. My master's degree is from this wonderful institution right next Great. door yep. and I actually have been a criminal justice practitioner for 33 years and I actually uh, am a probation officer and I professor at Hartman Community College. Great mm -hmm. and you're also an author and you're kind enough to bring me your books. <laughs> uh, the Douglas, gift from me Pastor Ken. <laughs> the Douglas Connection here um, by DeWitt Bingham. Also Viola Liuzzo a story about her and the civil rights movement. And then hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So three books that you have published, so we'll, I'll look forward to reading those. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very much welcome. Thank you. So what we're doing with the congregation, we want to get some some uh, many voices to our congregation. We're That's calling, awesome. this, calling this a season of learning and listening. Okay. Um, and so we want to listen and maybe hear some things that we don't hear every day or from people that we don't get to, to hear from every day. So, so thank you for being one of those people. So I want to just jump right in. Um, on Memorial Day, um, we saw a terrible death. Mr. George Floyd um, was killed while he was in police custody. How has that affected you? How did you experience that? Well, as an African-American, it was very hurtful to see that happen. Um, but it's been something that I've actually seen before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
I was hoping that they actually would arrest the officers right away uh, because to me it was pretty obvious that it actually they were in violation mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, the actual offense that was committed against him. Um, but in terms of, you know, it, it kind of makes you upset and, and angry about mm -hmm. it. But before I'm a probation officer, before I'm a professor, before even I'm African American, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And so I, I have to be able to maintain, you know, a Christ-like attitude about things. But it does get you upset, you know, when it seems as though that type of attitude and that, those types of incidents only occur uh, towards African American men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. What does it mean to be Christ-like? I think a lot of us are asking that. You know, how would Christ respond? Um, so maybe some, since you are a pastor, what, what's your thought? How would Christ respond when um, Christ experienced something like Mr. Uh, George Floyd's death? I, I think it's okay to actually speak out against mm -hmm. it uh, because right is right and wrong is wrong. And so I think Christ would actually take a stand against yeah. what, is actu what actually occurred. My main experience in terms of what I would consider to be race is, uh, has to do primarily with employment, which is a big thing that uh, African Americans deal with uh, in terms of in increasing their, their wealth. Uh, we built the country, or helped build the country for 400 years, but in terms of family net worth, yeah. it's 17, thousand for African Americans and 170,000 for whites. And so in terms of uh, my personal experience with racism, when I got to the department 33 years ago, I had a master's degree and since then 33 years of experience, but there right there was a time when I was only the sec uh, only two, second person that had a master's degree and when I applied for management positions, I uh, had worked different positions and had more experience, twice mm -hmm. the education, but didn't get promoted. Didn't get and so in terms of you know, racism for me, that's where I, I believe, this is just me, mm -hmm. that I've experienced it the most is mm -hmm. on, uh, in the workforce. What I would like to see is a few things. I would like to see, I just have this belief that the chokehold, and I've seen it, I've heard a couple of mm -hmm. departments are now gonna do away with that. <clears throat> But why do you need to actually have somebody, your knee on somebody's neck and are choking them when they're in handcuffs? Mm -hmm. You and I could probably write that law in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to see that. It, it also would be nice to see what I call uh, race officer uh, equality or equalization. For example, if you have 50 officers on a police force, then and 10% of your population is black, like here in Bloomington, then why not have at least 10% represent the police force? So Bloomington, for example, has 100 police officers. In my view, you should at least have 10 African-American officers because Bloomington Normal has 10% black population. And I've always said my hope in this lifetime is to actually see a judge on the 11th Judicial Circuit, uh, sit on the bench right. of the 11th Judicial Circuit, because we haven't had one. But <clears throat> that, that's just a few things that I'd like to see, you know, come out of that. Bloomington Normal actually is doing a really good job in terms of uh, they established a, you know, community review board. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a good and, yeah, and and so I really believe that we have good chiefs, we have great judges. Okay. It, anything else that you would like to say to our congregation? Um, any other thoughts or words of advice? Or no, I, I would just say you know, uh, just try to actually, uh, I would say, be sensitive to what's going on, you know, at this particular time, and you know, uh, just show love towards your brother. You know, like I, like I always try to say before I'm anything else, I'm a Christian. So, you know, if you say you're a Christian, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to look and I'm going to watch to see if your behavior yeah. reflects that. Right. And, and, and as you very well know, 
that's really what's going to make the difference if you actually are showing love towards mm-hmm. yeah. Well, Dwight, it's, it's been a pleasure. I wish I could shake you. your hand. I, I wish I could, too. <laughs> yeah, the, that's why we're sitting so far apart, you know, because of the social distancing. Um, but uh, anyway, it's we really do appreciate you coming. Look forward to, to uh, getting to know you better and, and well, laying with you in the future. It's, it's been a pleasure. I, I certainly will come back and visit you. Great. Okay. All right. All thank right. you very All much. All right. You're welcome. Please join in singing, We Are Called. Mary, it's a privilege to read the scripture this morning, which is from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, from the English Standard Version. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You can probably say these words with me. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
The Declaration of Independence goes on to say that this is really the purpose of government, is to secure these rights for people. There is something in each of us that longs for liberty, for freedom. Actually, if you've ever had a time when your liberty was taken away from you, when you didn't have freedom, you know how precious freedom is. Can you think of a time when you were not free for whatever reason? Think about a time when, when a weight was finally lifted off your chest or when you finally could fill your lungs with air again and breathe. What a good feeling that is. Or a time when finally you're able to, to move your arms and legs and let the blood begin to flow again and not be restrained and restricted. Oh, freedom. I think we all long for freedom because we were born to long for freedom. This week on June 19th, we have the opportunity to celebrate a holiday. It's the holiday of Juneteenth. Are you familiar with Juneteenth? A senator from Illinois one time, a man named Barack Obama, tried to get this passed in a Senate bill as a national holiday. Still hadn't passed, but it is a state holiday in 47 of our states, including Illinois. So what is Juneteenth? What's Juneteenth about? On June 19th, 1865, two months after General Robert E. Lee surrendered at the courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia, a Union general named Gordon Granger rode into Texas. General Granger then went to the public square and he took out his orders and he announced to all the people as he unread the orders, in part, he said this, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. All slaves are free. What a great thing. Freedom. I mean, just think about what it meant to live as a slave and then to hear these words, all slaves are free. Juneteenth, which is short for June 19th, is a holiday commemorating this day which marked the effective end of slavery here in the United States. Now, if, you'll know, if you know your history, you'll remember that it was two and a half years earlier, on January 1st, 1863, that the initial Emancipation Proclamation was announced by President Abraham Lincoln, right? So why are we celebrating the end of slavery two and a half years later as General Granger rides into Texas? Well, the unfortunate truth is sometimes good news arrives late. In Texas at that time, there were a lot of people spreading the news. There weren't a lot of people spreading the news that the slaves were free. I would dare say that most of the 250,000 men, women, and children who lived under the sweltering oppression of slavery never heard anyone tell them the good news that they were free. In fact, that's why some of the people who were living in Texas were there because they had taken their slaves and moved to Texas where they thought they, they would be able to continue the institution of slavery, where they wouldn't be interrupted. And some slave owners did finally getting around to telling their slaves they were free, but not even on June 19th of 1865. They waited until after the harvest were in then they told their slaves, oh yeah, there, there's an emancipation proclamation, you are free. And some slave owners never told their slaves that they were free. In fact, when some slaves found out that they had been freed and when they began to, to take off to leave, they were captured, they were beaten. Some of them were lynched or murdered in other ways. Sometimes the good news arrives late. In fact, when General Granger came, this general from the north, when he came to bring this good news, his announcement was a little bit half-hearted. He announced the Emancipation Proclamation, but then he went on to encourage uh, these slaves to continue to stay where they were, to live as free men, getting paid for their wages now, but to stay with the same farmers who had been their slave owners, and not to come to places where they could receive federal protection and aid. 
Some of the slaves, of course, did stay as freedmen in Texas, but many scattered, many left. Why? Well, because they, they did no longer wanted to live under these oppressive conditions, and also because they went to find their family members who had been sold off and separated from them in slave auctions. They were eager to be free, to be reunited. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Now, I should say that on 1979, Texas was the first state to make Juneteenth a state holiday. And as I mentioned, 47 other states now celebrate, 47 total states. I think all of us should celebrate Juneteenth this year. I think that this year is a good opportunity for all of us to think about what it means to end slavery and to end Jim Crow and to end racism in our time. Because we still have not lived up to the ideals of our nation, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people living here, of inalienable rights given to every man, woman, and child by God, our creator, freedom. You know, all this conversation reminds me of another day when another scroll was unrolled and read. When Jesus stood up in the synagogue and he was handed the scroll from the prophet Isaiah and he unrolled the scroll and he read these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of God's favor. And then you remember what happened? And then Jesus rolled the scroll back up and he gave it back to the attendant there at the synagogue. And then you remember what Jesus said? He said to the people today in your hearing, this scripture, this ancient scripture from the prophet Isaiah is fulfilled in me, in Jesus that I have come to make this a reality, to set free the captives, to bring liberty to all of God's people. Of course, it was shortly after that time that the people tried to throw Jesus off the cliff, but that's another story. Jesus says, I have come to bring freedom. He not only says it, but Jesus demonstrates it, demonstrates what it means to treat everyone with respect and dignity, to treat everyone as a precious child of God. He demonstrates it and he exemplifies it for us. And he says to us, now you go and do what I've done. Live as I've lived. Teach as I've taught. Be children of God, faithful to God in the way that I have shown you. In the kingdom of Jesus, there's no longer slaves and free. Everyone is free. There's no longer black and white Everyone is sacred and precious. If you want to be with Jesus, oh, we still have our distinctions. We still need to understand our differences, but that's not what matters anymore in the kingdom of Jesus because we are free. Good news, freedom. We have all been freed. The problem is that some of us don't know about freedom yet. Some of us are still weighed down by discrimination and injustice, being treated like we're not of sacred worth. And some of us are still being weighed down by bigotry, by our white privilege, by our prejudices, by the limits that we put in the way of God by not fully hearing and loving our neighbors. You know what we need? We need some people to saddle up and ride out and announce that the good news has come. To announce the emancipation, to announce liberty, to call for freedom, to say that all this slavery and and, and racial injustice has come to an end. We need some good news messengers to announce that there's time for a new day and that we all can work together to bring about this new day of good news. We need some followers of Jesus Christ to live like Jesus teaches us to live and to live like Jesus shows us how to live boldly 
We need to spread the good news. We need to live the good news. We need to be the good news in our communities, in our families, in our society. You know, I have a friend named Myron McGee who writes music. And at times like this, the words to one of his songs comes back to mind. He sings these words. Someday the victory will come. Someday the victory will be. Someday the victory will be yours and mine. Will we ever find it? Someday the victory can be. But if we don't open our, up our hearts, if we don't open up our hearts, someday may never come. It's time for good news. It's time for freedom. Let us open up our hearts so that day can come. Amen. As we join our hearts together in prayer today, I invite you to think especially about the words that we're praying as we pray the Lord's Prayer. That as we're praying for God's kingdom to come, what is it that that might mean? What that might require for us? How we might be part of God's kingdom here on earth? I will invite you to take a moment of silence to center yourself before God. And then I, the prayer that I'm using today is one that is um, adapted by uh, a Mennonite pastor, Mark Schlonegger. And so I give thanks to him for, for the, his words. Let's pray. Creator of our first breath, sustainer of our next breath, redeemer of all deep breath, we remember those who are finding it hard to breathe. We remember those who have died, those who are suffering, those who fear going out for a run, enjoying a day at the park, or even resting at home because of the color of their skin. We remember those with knees on their necks, literally and figuratively, pleading, I can't breathe, to the systems that we have created, sustained and beckoned to enforce what we call justice. They have names that we can so easily forget their families don't, you don't, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, and so, so many others. We cry out for justice. Have mercy, O oh Lord. Comfort family and friends who continue to grieve. Help us to honor their names by seeing, naming, and confronting the traces of white supremacy <clears throat> wherever it is found, in our country, in our community, in ourselves in the church, in this church. Creator of our first breath, sustainer of our next breath, redeemer of all deep breath, we confess that we feel so helpless, 
so powerless, so hopeless to do anything about the racism that runs so deep, extends so high, has gone on for so long that too many of us too often sigh the sigh of the privileged, lamenting injustice, but moving on, carrying on, holding on. What else can we do, we think, as we inhale and exhale the racist pollution that fills our country's skies? The poisoned air that we recognize only as air, the air that everyone must breathe to live. Forgive us our sin. Have mercy, O Lord, creator of our first breath, sustainer of our next breath, redeemer of all deep breath. We can't go on this way with broken bodies and broken bones and broken windows on our broken streets, breaking ourselves apart to protest all that is broken. Give our government leaders, give us the ears to hear the language of the unheard. Give them and give us the hearts to understand its origin. Give them and give us the will to be part of the healing and not the hurting. Come, O Pentecost breath, come from the four winds and cleanse our air. Help us breathe, help us help others breathe. In the name of Jesus, Come, O Pentecost breath, breathe, 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 so that together we all may live. God, we cry out this prayer to you as we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray boldly, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm so glad you were able to worship with us today. It's good to worship with you. I hope you found this time meaningful and I hope you have a great week. I also invite you to celebrate Juneteenth this week. June 19th, that'll be Friday, is a good day to celebrate Juneteenth. Of course, you can celebrate it anytime. You might read up on what Juneteenth is all about and how to celebrate. You may want to drink something red. You might want to eat some traditional food. But above all else, do something for freedom. Have a great week. May God bless you. Amen.